worry. It seems like that's what life is made of. There are so many things the enemy uses to bore into the core of our being and contaminate it with worry. We worry about our health. We worry about our children. We worry about our parents. We worry about our past. We worry about our future. We worry about our weaknesses. We worry about our assurance of salvation. We live in a very uncertain world where financial security can disappear like that. Richard Stearns tells the following story. In 1987, he says, the largest single day stock market crash since 1929 took place. In one day, my wife, Renee, and I lost more than one third of our life savings and the money that we had put aside for our children's college education. I was horrified, he says, like a man obsessed each night working past midnight, analyzing on spreadsheets all that we had lost, the next day calling in orders to sell our remaining stocks and mutual funds to prevent further losses. And he parenthetically comments that that, of course, turned out to be the worst thing to do. He said, I was consumed with anguish over our lost money, and it showed. Not only can our finances be peppered with worry, but our marriages can be obsessed by the same problem. An anonymous wife understandably retains her anonymity when she wrote, when I met Christ, I was a 49-year-old and had been married to my husband for 17 years. We had two children, lived in a quiet, urban, or suburban life, we had built a life that was comfortable and expected by our respective families. Am I in trouble? Okay. Sometimes I've been told I get too close to this thing and it's not working right. But I knew at the moment that everything about my life was going to change when she accepted Christ. And if I was obedient and followed him, I could most definitely lose it all. My marriage, my life the way I knew it, my friends, my family. Becoming a Christian was a new life for me, a joy and an answer to a life with no real meaning. But becoming a Christian also meant that there was a definite possibility that my husband would cease to love me. How could I know? He would stay with me if I was so thoroughly a new person. How could I know that my husband who was not a believer, would value our marriage vows. I was extremely afraid. At times, I didn't want to have this new life. Honestly, I didn't think it was worth it. I wanted to give it back to God. I wanted to run the other way. Satan immediately began his work, bent on the destruction of our marriage. I cannot tell you how swiftly Satan moved. He continued shaping and molding true hate for for the one thing my husband despised, those religious types, and I was now one of them. I weighed my devotion for Christ against my devotion to my kids and family. I asked whether um, a broken marriage with Christ was better than a marriage without Christ. Even our jobs can be driven by worry. Kyle Edelman tells his story he says, I started a new church in Los Angeles, California, and found that I was overwhelmed with pressure and stress. I was working more than 70 hours a week. My wife would ask me to take a day off, and I said, I can't. I wasn't sleeping at night. I started to take sleeping pills. When the church was about a year old, I woke up in the night, and I had this sense that God was laughing at me. Hmm. I lay in bed, I wondered, why is God laughing at me? Well, in any given year, 18% of Americans suffer from an anxiety disorder. That's twice the number of those who suffer from depression. If you broaden the study to include anyone who experiences an anxiety order in their lifetime, the number increases to nearly 30%. Our levels of anxiety have increased dramatically over the past 50 years, and um, Robert Leahy, in his book Anxiety Free, says the average American today exhibits 
the same level of anxiety as an average psychiatric patient did 50 years ago. Hard to believe. But he kind of explains that even though there is mater material comfort and, and security may be higher now than it was back then, other prevailing issues like uh, separation from extended family, loss of community and neighborhood, uncertain employment, threats of terrorism, uncertain futures, high medical costs, immersion in technology. Brett alluded to that in the Sabbath school lesson where everybody seems to be disconnected from people, but they're connected to the internet, their, their phone. Well, he warns, the same individual warns, we live in an age of anxiety. We've become a nation of nervous wrecks. So what are we to do? Well, some people try medications to alleviate their anxiety. Others medicate on Ill illegal substances, some on legal substances like alcohol. For some, entertainment can be a form of medication. And for others, food can be how we cope with anxiety. I remember when we did some health education, they were talking about substitute gratification, which alludes to the idea of eating food to calm our worries. <clears throat> well, Jesus, of course, gave a much better prescription, didn't he? In the 46th Psalm, this is the New Living Translation, it says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble, kind of a figurative way of alluding to the, some of the things we described already. I don't know how many of you have read <clears throat> the 16th Psalm, but in verses 8 to 11, um, David writes this Psalm, and Peter actually explains it, saying that this is really written about Jesus. And it's a wonderful um, passage. Um, I need to turn to it. Pardon me while I do that. <clears throat> so it's a messianic psalm that David wrote, was inspired to write, and it reads, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and eternal pleasures at your right hand. So Jesus really modeled for us, didn't he, how to deal with anxiety and be, to, you know, we could ask the question, was Jesus ever consumed by anxiety? I don't think he was. He was concerned, and there is a point at which concern morphs into anxiety, but I don't think Jesus worried. Worried describes a state of being that kind of factors God out of the picture, doesn't it? And it seems like that morphing experience really happens when we become so focused on our concern that our faith seems to, well, Donna used the word backslide, slip. We feel like we're in, in a, <laughs> playing mud football, don't have much traction. And then, of course, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount alluded to it many times. I mean, he wouldn't tell us not to do something if it was possible, if it was impossible not to do it, right? So he says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then he asks this question, are you not much more valuable than they? Who of, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? So we could rephrase that. Who of you, by worrying, could solve the problem that you're worrying about? You can't, because you're so disconnected to the solution to the problem um, that we're just consumed by that. And so we start medicating ourselves with substitute gratification and medicine or other things that, uh, maybe even entertainment. I don't think I mentioned that as, a, as a, something in our medicine cabinet that we use to medicate our worry. 
So Jesus again asked the question, why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not spin or labor. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and uh, tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So he repeats himself. So do not worry, saying, what we sh shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you, uh, that you need them. Then he gives this prescription. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Therefore, if we're seeking his kingdom, we're not going to be um, sidetracked by worry. I forget what, it, what the saying is. Corey Ten Boom has something to say about that, something about zapping all the strength for tomorrow. That's what worry accomplishes, and it's true. So if what we value is temporary and perishable, our angst will be high. And so he encouraged us to invest in things that are permanent, that cannot be taken away from us. Um, so we need to embrace Jesus. And I'm so glad it wasn't a book of rules that he gave us, but it was Jesus that he gave us. Um, flesh and blood, somebody who walked the same path we've walked, and he's capable of ministering to our needs, whatever it is we worry about. Relationships, you know, there, there's a list of probably thousands of items long that we can worry about. So let's finish these stories that we started with. What happened to Richard Stearns and his wife, Renee, who lost more than one-third of their life savings and the money that they had put aside for their college, kids' college education? He goes on to say, one night when I was burning the midnight oil, Renee came in and sat beside me. Honey, she said, this thing is consuming you in an unhealthy way. It's only money. We have our marriage, our health, our friends, our children, and a good income. So much to be thankful for. You need to let this go and trust God. I didn't want to let go of it, he says. I told her I felt responsible for the family and that she didn't understand it was my job to worry. <laughs> he thought he was getting paid to worry. She suggested that we pray about it, something that I hadn't even thought of. Uh, so we did. At the end of pr our prayer, to my bewilderment, Renee said, Now, I think we need to get out the checkbook and write some big checks to our church and ministries we support. We need to show God that we trust him and that we believe this is his money, not ours. I was flabbergasted by her audacity. But in my heart, I knew she was right. So that night, we wrote some sizable checks, put them in envelopes, and addressed them to these various ministries. And that's when I fe felt a wave of relief. We had broken the spell that money cast over us. Interesting caveat to the story, 11 years later, uh, Richard Stern was elected to become the president of World Vision, which he did for 20 years. And if you're familiar with them, you know that they're a kind of a carbon copy or a clone, not a clone, but very similar to an organization we have, which is Adventist Development and Relief Agency. Well, what about the 49-year-old woman who became a Christian and was distraught over the potential loss of her family? Here's how she closes her story. Gradually, Christ's words became my words. His love filled and poured out of me, and I was able to love the man who called me his enemy. I found that I could love my husband with a resolve I'd never experienced. In the year and a half that has followed, many blessings have been bestowed upon our family. It may not be apparent to my husband, but our marriage is very different because of Christ. Christ is the center and is shaping our partnership in a new and distinctly Christian way. Additionally, my husband has changed dramatically from the man he was two years ago. He told me I should go ahead and attend church and gave me his blessing. My children began going to youth group, and now both of my children are worshiping with me weekly. And when I asked my husband if he would support my daughter and me as part of a, a mission trip to Mexico, he responded, we will make it happen. 
Reminds me of a passage in Corinthians. I can't quote it or tell you exactly where it is, but you remember it, where the unbelieving spouse, spouse is sanctified by the faith of the, believer, of the believer. Remember reading that? Well, here's an illustration of that fact. So she goes on to say, I've entrusted my husband to Christ's care. I'm okay with that. I've learned many lessons in the past year and a half, but none so much as loving and trusting my Lord. Well, what about the guy who um, awoke with a sense of God was laughing at him? His story is that he was moving into a new house, and uh, by this time he had a four-year-old boy, and they'd saved the heaviest piece to last, and it was his desk, and he was having a tough time of it, He's gradually moving it, making a little progress, and his four-year-old boy comes and says, I'll help. So he got on the other side and started pushing. And pretty soon, his little boy got impatient with him and said, Dad, get out of the way. You're getting in my way. And he had to laugh. And then it recur occurred to him, that must be what God was laughing about. Me, when I was doing 70 hours of, week, of work a week, In Mark chapter 14, verses 27 to 31, Jesus revealed to his disciples what they would never have thought possible. Jesus said, you will all fall away. The reason I'm re reading this passage or referring to this passage is because if you read the verse before John 14 in chapter 13, <clears throat> it only records Jesus' words to Peter, like he was being singled out. And maybe that's reasonable since Peter seems to be the back, the person in back of Mark's gospel. But in, um, I'm sorry, John only singles out um, Peter. And he doesn't refer to the other disciples. And he said, you know, Peter said when it was revealed to him that he would deny Christ. He said, I'll never do that. And it, it says the disciples, uh, I think Peter is recorded as having said, I'll even give my life to you. How could, I, how could I deny you? And the other disciples in Mark, it says they did the same thing. So it seems like the setting is perfect for us to apply our text to this situation of worry. Even though it doesn't use the word worry, <clears throat> it uses the word, don't let your hearts be troubled. And so in reviewing that again, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be consumed by worry, Jesus said. Trust in God, trust also in me. You have a bright future ahead of yourself. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. It's interesting that the 14th chapter of uh, John not only begins with this, but it also ends with this, where Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled, in verse 27, and do not be afraid. <clears throat> I would like to share with you a passage, and I think it's, it's um, how should I put it? It's, it's a <clears throat> good experience to, once you find a verse that means uh, something personal to you. It's a good idea to reflect on that. Not only reflect on it, but let it um, ingrain itself in your memory and really memorize it. We've kind of gotten away. We have memory verses in our Sabbath school lesson, <clears throat> but I, su I suspect that it's a rare person who memorizes that, which is all right. I'm not saying you must do that, but it seems like a compelling argument. If we have found something that really nourishes our heart, it's really beneficial, significantly beneficial, for us to make that part of our recall. When I was canvassing as a student call porter, <clears throat> I started doing that my, uh, f after my freshman year at PUC. And I couldn't sell candy to a sugar addict, but uh, I felt the Lord called me to canvas. And um, part of the training team <clears throat> one was the father of one of the guys who was in a grade ahead of me, <clears throat> and we'd, <clears throat> pardon me, we played basketball together or against each other, but I really respected his dad. 
And this is one of the things he encouraged us to do because we had the desire of ages, we had patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, Acts of the Apostles, great controversy. And I remember reading through the desire of ages and coming across this passage, which says, worry is blind and cannot discern the future. Jesus sees the end from the beginning. In every difficulty, he has his way prepared to bring relief. He goes on to say, our heavenly father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. If we make the one principle of the service and honor of God supreme, we will find perplexities vanish in a plain path before our feet. And I found that to be true when I've memorized passages, passages of scripture. And I will probably be the first one to say that I don't do it often enough, but I want to encourage you to join me when you find something particularly encouraging to yourself, that it may continue to be a source of strength. And who knows, but it may be preparing you for something you have not yet anticipated. And I have another story about that for another time. But 